Got it. Okay. Um, please help me welcome our speaker for the morning. Professor Avi Loeb is the Frank B. Baird Jr. Professor of Science at Harvard University, Director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And he is the head of the Galileo Project. He earned his PhD in physics from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and was at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton before joining the Harvard faculty in 1993. He has the distinction of having served, having been the longest serving chair of Harvard's Department of Astronomy, as well as the founding director of Harvard's Black Hole Institute. Professor Loeb has authored or co-authored almost 1,000 <clears throat> research publications on a wide range of topics in astronomy and cosmology, including black holes, the first stars, the search for extraterrestrial life, and the future of the universe. A prolific writer and a best-selling author, Professor Loeb has written eight books. His most recent book, Extraterrestrial, and a forthcoming book, Interstellar, are listed in the chat where you also find a link to his collection of opinion essays. Well, with that, Professor Loeb, again, welcome to the Greenway Talks online at Palomar Observatory. We have a large audience today and welcome to all. Thank you for joining us. You can type questions into the chat at any time and we'll take questions at the end of the presentation. And we'll ask everyone right now to turn off your microphones. And with that, Professor Avi Loeb, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we could have saved some time if you were to introduce me as a farm boy, because that's fundamentally what I am. It would have taken you a few seconds. I was born on a farm, <clears throat> collected eggs every afternoon, and, and was became very fascinated or connected to nature, much more than to people. And... Uh, um, I jog every morning. This morning I jogged in the company of wild turkeys. And, you know, I don't have any footprint on social media. I don't care how, my, how many likes I get. Uh, what I want to understand is the reality that we live in. And that's what I'll be speaking about. So let me share my screen. And open up the presentation and they, I'll try to make it as brief as possible and allow you to ask as many questions as you want. Okay, so what you see in the middle is the cover of the book that I wrote two years ago. And as, as was mentioned, uh, I have a new book coming in uh, August this year um, titled um, Interstellar. And if I had to summarize my previous book, I would say, uh, when you're not willing uh, to find exceptional things, you will never discover them. Uh, I also wrote um, a couple of years ago a textbook uh, of more than a thousand pages uh, called The Life in the Cosmos. You see it on the right hand side. And what you see on the left is a photograph that was taken in uh, my office uh, several years ago by the German photographer, Herlinde Quilbel, who will actually visit uh, Boston in, in a month and um, I will see her again. She, she came to my office and asked me to write on the palm of my hand, the question that is most significant for me in science. And I wrote, are we alone? And this, uh, a uh, photograph was displayed at the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science and Humanities. She took about 25 such photos from scientists all over the world. 
And what I'll focus on today is the Galileo project that uh, I established a year and a half ago after a few multi-billionaires came to the porch of my home. They read the book Extraterrestrial, were inspired by the vision, and donated funds towards my research account at Harvard. And after announcing this project, we uh, within a few months, we had 100 volunteer members and, uh, and about 1,000 applicants that wanted to join the project. And I'll talk more about what the project does. So let me start with a short video. We had um, a first conference in August 2022, um, just six months ago um, at Harvard. And this is a video taken at that time. It's such a great privilege and pleasure to see 70 members of the Galileo Project team coming together, celebrating the past year accomplishments of the project. And uh, we are just at the beginning uh, because in the coming year, we hope to collect data and find out what it shows. Uh, we, we make no assumptions, we're completely agnostic, but it seems like the government is telling us that there are some exciting objects out there that we need to figure out what they are. And that's our goal. For now, we assemble the relevant instruments, we're testing them, and we will soon deploy them and start collecting data because the sky is not classified, and we very much hope to discover what the nature of objects that the government is talking about and that astronomers are talking about. That look like outliers are. Are they technological in origin from another planet or are they natural phenomena? And the Galileo project aims to find out along three tracks. One is looking at unidentified aerospace phenomena in the sky and uh, imaging them in the infrared, optical, radio, and audio bands. The second is rendezvousing with interstellar objects in space and taking a close look at them. It will cost about a billion dollars to meet an interstellar object. Uh, there is a much cheaper way of doing that, and that is to find an interstellar meteor. We know of one that landed near Papua New Guinea uh, in 2014, and we plan to search for the fragments from this meteor by scooping the ocean floor. And that is the third branch of the Galileo project. So we have very exciting times ahead and we look forward to what we will find. Okay, so let, let me move on. Um, oops, okay. So let me start with a brief introduction. Um, because um, what we're trying to follow is evidence. And the question is, I mean, that's the approach of science. And the question is, what do we know so far? Uh, we know that a substantial fraction of the sun-like stars, somewhere between 3% to 100%, um, host an Earth-sized planet, roughly at the same separation. Okay, so the conditions we find in our backyard are not unusual, and there are more habitable Earths in the observable volume of the universe, and there are grains of sand on all beaches on Earth. Um, and so if you look at a picture of an emperor or a king that conquered a small piece of land, and the incarnation of such uh, an image is uh, Putin today that wants to conquer a piece of Ukraine, or um, that looks a bit uh, ridiculous because it just resembles an ant trying to hug a single grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach. What the universe teaches us is cosmic modesty. We are not that important as we wish to believe. We are not at the center of the universe. I can understand where it's coming from because when I watched my two daughters when they were young, 
they lived at home and they thought that the world centers on them and that they are the smartest. But they had a psychological shock when I brought them on the first day to the kindergarten because they met a smarter kid on the block. And so the fundamental question is, are we the smartest kid on our cosmic block? Probably not. And our civilization will mature by finding others, not by insisting that we are the smartest, we are alone on social media. That can buy you some time because you will not look out, but it will not change the reality that we live in. My point is that Albert Einstein was not necessarily the smartest scientist who ever lived since the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. What you see is a cartoon that was drawn on the day that Einstein died. It shows the earth with the plaque, Albert Einstein lived here. Now, obviously we are all proud of Einstein, but it's very likely that there is a scientist smarter, or there was a scientist smarter than Einstein on a habitable planet around another star who predated Einstein by billions of years. Because most stars formed billions of years before the sun. So the clock of our civilization started ticking earlier. And the civilization that benefited from such, from the wisdom of such a scientist could have sent probes that would have reached us by now. Even if they use just chemical rockets as we are using, it takes half a billion years for the existing spacecraft that we use to traverse the entire Milky Way, half a billion years. And most stars formed several billion years before the sun. We know that because we observe the star formation history of the universe. And so the question is, do we live in a reality where probes visited the solar system or are visiting? And these will not likely be biological creatures. They, they would most likely be systems with artificial intelligence because that represents our future and they're much more suitable for space travel that takes could take millions of years. Um, biological creatures were selected by Darwinian evolution to survive on the surface of a rock like Earth, but not to survive in space. There are many hazards out there. Um, and so my point is, we, if we decided to, instead of wasting the money we currently spend on militaries, uh, uh, military budgets, if we took these $2 trillion a year and invested those $2 trillion a year in space exploration, then within a few decades, we could send a probe towards every star in the Milky Way galaxy, a CubeSat. I did that calculation. Within several decades, we can send a CubeSat that will visit every star in the Milky Way, tens of billions of probes. If we just gave up on fighting each other and killing people, which is a ridiculous ambition. Anyway, makes no sense. We live for such a short time, why shorten it even farther? You know, I, saw, I watched the movie uh, All Quiet on the Western Front about the First World War just a couple of weeks ago. My grandfather fought in the First World War. It made no sense. Young kids were sent to the front to be slaughtered. And how can, I mean, that is clearly not a sign of intelligence on behalf of the politicians who sent them, on behalf of those kids who followed what the politicians suggested. And what I'm saying is if instead of wasting resources on fighting each other, we would explore interstellar space, we could do a lot in a few decades. So the only way to find out if we live in a reality where probes are visiting us 
is to look out. We should not repeat the mistake of philosophers, theologians, four centuries ago, who knew that the earth is at the center of the universe, and they refused to look through Galileo Galilei's uh, telescope. They put him in house arrest. And of course, uh, if we would have kept what they believed in, uh, we would never be able to reach Mars because the idea was that Mars moves around the Earth. We know now that this is wrong. So reality is whatever it is, irrespective of whether it matches our wishes. Now, what do we know about objects from outside the solar system? You know, for 70 years, we've been searching for radio signals. This is just like waiting at, at home for a phone call. You can wait forever. Nobody will call you. Or maybe they did call us, but a long time ago. And now the radio signals are billions of light years away. A much better approach is to look for objects. It's just like searching your mailbox for packages. Even if the senders are not alive anymore, because, for example, they lived next to a star that by now is billions of years older than the sun, and so it burned up the surface of the planet closely because it's a red giant or it became hotter. Who cares if those civilizations sent already probes and they're gravitationally bound to the Milky Way galaxy, we would find them nearby, sort of like doing archaeology. So that's a completely different approach. And, you know, very strangely, the people who pursue SETI have a problem with that approach. They dismiss it. They ridicule it. They argue against it. Something that was never clear to me. On top of the people in the mainstream of astronomy that don't want to discuss it. So anyway, this is a new path that uh, we are embarking on with the Galileo project. And what was the first report on an, in, on an object that came from outside the solar system? It came in 2017, October 19th, uh, from the Pan-STARRS telescope, survey telescope in Hawaii. The intention of Pan-STARRS was to look for near-Earth objects. So in 2017, they noticed a near-Earth object. It was flagged as near-Earth. If it didn't pass close to Earth, nobody would pay attention to it. But it came within roughly a sixth of the Earth-Sun separation. So they said, oh, here is a near-Earth object catalog. Then they noticed, oh, this near-Earth object is really different. It's moving too fast to be bound to the Sun. So it came from outside the solar system. Hence, the first report on an interstellar object ever in astronomy, first. Just to demonstrate the fact that prior to the last decade, we didn't have the capability to detect an interstellar object the size of a Muamua. This is the name of the object. It means a scout in the Hawaiian language. Um, we couldn't detect such an object before the last decade. So it's a completely new frontier. This object was the size of a football field, around 100 meters in size. And we noticed it from the reflection of sunlight. There might be many more objects smaller than 100 meters. In fact, NASA never launched a spacecraft as big as 100 meters. So there may be a lot of objects passing in the dark, and we wouldn't notice them because they don't reflect enough sunlight. So at first, this was intriguing to me because I wrote a paper a decade earlier forecasting how many rocks do we expect from interstellar space based on what we know about the solar system. And we predicted in that paper that there would be no such rock detected by pan stars. By orders of magnitude, somewhere the, the mismatch was by a factor of 100 to 100 million. Nothing should be detected by pan stars. There is not enough rocks in interstellar space. And yet they found Oumuamua. So then the question was, what, you know, how is it possible that we were off by orders of magnitude? So that's why it was intriguing to me. 
And of course, I assumed that it's a rock at first, but the more data we got about it, the more peculiar it looked. So let me just mention, I will mention a few details about it in a few slides, but the bottom line is this was not actually the first object discovered from interstellar space. There was a meteor detected back in January 2014 by the US government. And it was put in a catalog called CNEOS that JPL under NASA compiles that includes all the meteors detected by the US government. You know, the US government wants to find ballistic missiles, anything that is of threat to national security. And every now and then they see an object burning up that came from outer space. And they catalog it as a meteor. And we were looking with my student, Amir Siraj, we were looking through that catalog and checking whether there is any object with a speed that exceeds the escape speed from the solar system. And we found one from 2014. That is the first interstellar object, actually, before Oumuamua. It was roughly half a meter in size. And obviously, we could detect it, even though it was much smaller than Oumuamua, because it collided with the Earth and it burned up in the atmosphere as a result of the friction with air. So we submitted a paper for publication and then my colleagues said, rejected. We don't believe the US government. It must have a lot of uncertainties. And I thought to myself, well, the US government is in the business of figuring out whether ballistic missiles will hit Washington DC or Boston. They cannot afford very large uncertainties. But the paper was rejected from the Astrophysical Journal. So the only choice I had was to approach. I was chair of the board on physics and astronomy of the National Academies at the time. And one of the board members was from Los Alamos. And I also had a contact person in the White House. So I asked them to help me and uh, get a confirmation based on the data the government has. And it took three years because the government is really slow. They're worried about adversaries knowing what kind of sensors we, we are using. And anyway, on in March, exactly a year ago, there was this letter that you see on the left sent from the United States Space Command under the Department of Defense. So in a way, ironically, the Department of Defense came to my defense. And in that letter, you can see the first bullet point that they confirm the interstellar origin of this object at the 99.999% confidence. So we resubmitted the paper to the Astrophysical Journal and it was accepted. By now it's published a few months ago. But at the same time, after this confirmation, we decided to go to the site where the meteor exploded and look for the fragments from it. Why? Why did we do that? Because this object appeared to have been of very unusual material strength. So in fact, the government also released the light curve from the fireball the, when the object exploded. There were three flares, as you can see. And here you see a plot of the amount of energy released, which was roughly the entire energy consumption uh, on electricity in the globe over a fraction of a second. Uh, it, this meteor released a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic bomb energy. And we plot here the power that it, it dissipated as a function of the ambient pressure um, that was exerted on its surface um, uh, as a result of it moving through the atmosphere. And, in order for this object to withstand that extreme ram pressure from its motion through the air down to the lower atmosphere, it had to have a material composition that is tougher than iron. Iron meteorites make up only 5% of all space rocks. This was the toughest object in the catalog, of CNEOS catalog, out of 273 space rocks. Why would the first interstellar meteor be the toughest in the entire catalog. 
One possibility is that it came from a source that is very different than the, the solar system. So it's natural in origin, but from something else. Another possibility is that it was made of an artificial alloy. It's actually a spacecraft from another civilization. We're going to find out. We actually have a paper where we calculated the size distribution of the fragments. If it's made of iron, the fragments will be uh, typically a gram or less. If it's made of stainless steel, there would be fragments bigger than 10 grams. And then we found a second interstellar meteor that was also <laughs> among uh, the top uh, uh, in material strength among all the meteors in that catalog. So the chance of having both of them, uh, both interstellar meteors drawn randomly out of the distribution of space rocks is less than one part in 10,000. Both of them were tougher than iron. So let me show a, a brief video on the expedition. My name is Avi Lo, professor of science at Harvard University. In the coming months, I'm going to lead an expedition to Papua New Guinea to scoop the ocean floor and search for fragments from the first interstellar meteor. Although Avi is in search of what he believes may be alien technology, proof of extraterrestrial existence has never been what's driven his life's work. Until now, I'm hopeful we would find something. The question is, what is it, an unusual rock, a natural object, or artificial? Despite being the longest serving chair of Harvard University's Department of Astronomy, it wasn't until recently that he started to investigate the possibility that there is life beyond our solar system. I found the catalog that the government compiled of meteors that were detected by government sensors uh, that are missile warning systems. I asked my students to check if any of the meteors, the fastest moving meteors, could have arrived to Earth from outside the solar system. There was one in particular that sparked the interest of Lowe and his students, Amir Siraj. We decided to write a paper about this meteor, which was discovered on January 8th. 2014, light from the exploding was seen by government sensors, despite the government releasing limited data. He had discovered something groundbreaking. His paper laid out what he believed to be true. But three years after writing his findings, a major development confirmed what he knew all along. After a few years, the release of a letter from the U.S. Space Command in the Department of Defense stating explicitly that this meteor at the 99.999% confidence level came from outside the solar system. Based on the speed of the meteor and how much of the object burned upon entry, Avi determined that it must be made of a material that is tougher than iron. And so this one was an outlier in terms of its composition. It was also an outlier in terms of its speed outside the solar system. It moved at least twice as fast as stars move relative to the sun in the vicinity of the sun. Armed with new evidence validating its findings, Avi decided to take action and make moves to recover the object his next hurdle. Funding through private donations, he has secured a portion of the money to take the trip. Let's continue to look for objects like it. It was obvious to us that we need to go there and collect the fragments because to do the same thing for an object in space would cost more than a billion dollars. For a cost that is a thousand times lower, we can go to the ocean floor and collect material from an interstellar object. Now, Ali has the task of finding an object that most likely flashing on impact, leaving fragments possibly the size of pennies lost at the bottom of the ocean. It's a challenge that might seem insurmountable in the vast existence of the Pacific Ocean. But Avi is confident they will recover what they are in search of. It's a fishing expedition, literally speaking, and what we can do is basically take the trajectory of this meteor and extrapolate it all the way to the ocean surface. Now, of course, when the explosion took place, there were fragments generated and they were scattered over a region. One imagines that the tiny pellets would be carried farther away from the point of impact, whereas the heavier 
fragments will sink down closer to the impact. Finding a big chunk can inform us much more about the structure of the original function. We're planning to board the ship and build a sled and a magnet attached to it that will scoop the ocean floor and we will go back and forth like mowing the lawns across the region, 10 kilometers in size, and collect with a magnet all the fragments that are attracted to it and then brush them off and study their composition in the laboratory. This will be the first time that humans put their hands on the material that makes an object that came from another star. With more advanced technology in our sky, than in any other point in history, new findings are becoming far more frequent and impossible to ignore. Thanks to a government report that was released last year, the possibility of extraterrestrial life and the pursuit of proof of its existence is finally losing its stigma. The stigma has been reduced. It would be the most important scientific discovery that humanity ever made because if you think about it, it will change our perspective about our place in the universe. With science in his corner, this professor is not intimidated by critics. It's not a philosophical question whether we live in an environment where objects are floating around that are representing extraterrestrial technologies. We just need to use our telescopes and find out. In fact, we are not even the first to say that. Galileo Galilei said that four centuries ago, and he was put in house arrest. Today, he would have been canceled on social media. Once I realized that we found an object from a technological origin that was produced elsewhere, I would not seek approval from anyone else. I don't need likes on Twitter. I just want to know what it is. Okay. Um, so as, as mentioned, we are planning an expedition. It will be in the first half of May. We have the funding. Uh, I had a Zoom call with uh, a wealthy individual who said, no problem, you have the money. Uh, and we have a team of very experienced uh, uh, people, the, the best in the world that uh, will go on that expedition. So everything is ready. We are now in the preparation phase. Um, and one important aspect of this was to figure out exactly the location of the meteor uh, explosion site. And for that purpose, we used data just uh, recently from a seismometer on Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. And uh, basically it recorded the sound signal from this meteor, sort of like uh, the sound of the universe knocking on our door. And uh, the sound goes in air. It can also go through the water or the ground. And we were able to fit I mean, it appeared in two packets, even though the explosion itself was just two tenths of a second. As you can see, the signal itself is hundreds of seconds long. And we figured it out and were able to fit the signal with a very good model. And we were able to figure out uh, at the distance to within a kilometer squared. Uh, so that was very good news. and. It's also an answer to Fermi's paradox. Uh, back 70 years ago at Los Alamos, Fermi, Enrico Fermi asked the question, where is everybody? Well, the answer may be, check the front door. Um, I will not get into all the details, but hopefully within a few months, we'll know more about this object. Now, let me get back to Oumuamua, which was the subject of my book. So that was the third object. So there were the first two interstellar meteors. Uh, the first one was uh, January 2014. The second one was March 2017. Both were roughly a meter in size. And then Oumuamua was discovered from the reflection of sunlight. So it didn't really collide with the Earth. It was not a meteor, but it was uh, much bigger. Otherwise, we wouldn't detect it. And the first strange property of Oumuamua was that it came from a very special frame of reference. It's called the local standard of rest. That's the frame that you get to when you average over the motions of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. Sort of like the galactic rest frame nearby. And only one in 500 stars 
is so much at rest in that frame as Oumuamua was. So it was like a buoy sitting at rest on the surface of the ocean, and then the sun bumped into it like a giant ship, because the sun moves relative to the local standard of rest. And then the sun gave it a kick through gravity. So it kicked Oumuamua out of that frame. And as the object passed close to the sun, uh, the amount of sunlight reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. As it was tumbling every eight hours. And that's a huge variation. It means the object had an extreme shape, uh, most likely flat, uh, based on detailed analysis of the light curve. And that made it extreme compared to other asteroids. Uh, the flat shape was deduced in this paper at the 90% confidence level. That was favored compared to a cigar shape. And the most unusual property of Oumuamua was that it exhibited non-gravitational acceleration and like additional push away from the sun that is not related to the sun's gravity. And of course, one can get such a push if the object is evaporating. So there is a, a cometary uh, effect, uh, just like the rocket effect pushing it. Uh, but the Spitzer Space Telescope looked uh, around the object and didn't find any traces of carbon-based molecules or dust. So it was clearly not a comet. You can see the image from the Spitzer St Space Telescope on the top right, and it's it's just noise. So this repulsive force declined inversely with distance squared from the sun. And the only thing that came to my mind was that it may be the result of the reflection of sunlight. But in order for that to be effective, the object had to be very thin, sort of like a sail, because previously I mentioned that it was flat. So flat and thin sounds like a sail, but nature doesn't make such objects. So I suggested maybe it's artificial in origin. And I just wrote uh, a new paper about um, a week ago, suggesting maybe it was a piece from uh, broke, a broken Dyson sphere. We can talk about it if there are any questions about it, but Dyson spheres are expected to be thin, uh, and they could be broken by uh, asteroids hitting them. So altogether, there were many anomalies that Oumuamua exhibited. My colleagues said, no, it's natural, period, exclamation mark. It's natural, forget about it, let's move on. And after they said that, there were a few teams that tried to actually explain the anomalies. So the first suggestion was maybe it's a fluffy cloud of dust particles, a hundred times less dense than air, so that it gets pushed by reflecting sunlight. The problem with that idea is that such a porous uh, structure would not survive coming very close to the sun when it gets heated by hundreds of degrees. If it's it doesn't have the material strength to withstand heating by hundreds of degrees close to the sun. Then there was another suggestion. Oh, so maybe it's a, a chunk of frozen hydrogen. So when it evaporates, it's actually a comet, but hydrogen is transparent. We've never seen a chunk of frozen hydrogen the size of a football field, and you cannot make it in planetary disks. It has to be made in molecular clouds, and the big problem is it wouldn't survive the journey. I showed in a paper that it would evaporate very quickly as a result of absorbing starlight. So then another suggestion came along uh, saying, oh, well, maybe it's a nitrogen iceberg chipped off a surface of a planet like Pluto. Well, the problem there, as we showed in a paper with my student, is that there, there isn't enough solid nitrogen on all the exoplutos 
in the Milky Way galaxy to produce a large enough population of nitrogen icebergs. As I mentioned before, even if we were to use rocks that are of usual composition, that wasn't enough. As I mentioned from a decade before Oumuamua was discovered. So now you want to, to make it out of nitrogen, which is uh, solid only on a small fraction of planets and a small fraction of the total mass budget. So that's, that's also quite challenging. The fundamental question is, was Oumuamua natural or artificial in origin? And the way I think of this is, if you go to the beach, very often you find rocks that are naturally produced. But every now and then you see a plastic bottle. And that could have been Oumuamua, telling us there is a civilization out there. Now, the interesting part of this story is that three years later, there was another object discovered by the same telescope in Hawaii, Pan stars, and this object was given the name 2020 SO. You can read the Wikipedia page about it. It exhibited an excess push away from the sun as a result of reflecting sunlight. There was no cometary tail. What is it? Within a few weeks, the astronomers realized, oh, if we trace the trajectory back in time, it actually came from Earth. It's a rocket booster of a 1966 launch by NASA to the moon. So we know that this object, 2020 SO, was made of stainless steel. That's why it didn't have a cometary tail. We also know the walls were thin. That's why it was pushed by reflecting sunlight. So we know it's artificial because we produced it. The question is, who produced Oumuamua? And if you imagine a cave dweller that is used to playing with rocks, that cave dweller, when finding a cell phone, would argue that it's a rock of a type that he had never seen before. But of course, he might throw it away, moving on to the routine um, examination of rocks. Uh, but if he has any kids, one of his kids might be curious about this rock and press a button and realize that it's not a rock because it can record his voice or her voice. Now, with respect to Oumuamua, there were several interesting uh, responses other than uh, mainstream scientists. For example, there was there is this uh, very good... Uh, vineyard called Boni Dune in uh, Santa Cruz that decided to have a wine to celebrate the discovery of Oumuamua. We used it at the banquet of the Galileo project. And there was also this. Here's your clue. I look at the world and I notice it's turning. Thanks to this man who studied at the University of Krakow in the 1490s. Who is Brahe? No, correct response, who is Nicholas Copernicus? You lose a little bit? Pick again, Robin. Scientist for 600. We think of this Russian who became a professor of general chemistry in 1867 periodically. Robin. Who is Mendeleev? Yes. Scientist 300. Avi Loeb thinks a space object seen in 2017 and artistically depicted here comes from this 16-letter type of being, the title of his book. Kevin. What is that, extraterrestrial? Correct. Uh, scientists for a thousand. Okay. Okay, we'll move on. Um, I also received um, a couple of emails from uh, rabbis, one in uh, uh, 2021, another one in 2022, who uh, said that they gave a sermon uh, inspired by my book. And that is actually very interesting because the frontiers of science um, have something in common with spirituality because uh, both explore the unknown. So altogether, you know, there is a new frontier now, which is exploration of 
objects that came from outside the solar system uh, that come close to Earth. And the government, as you know, from the past week when they shut down four balloons, um, you know, they, the government is also very interested in that. There was a report from the director of national intelligence talking about hundreds of re- hundreds of objects that are not identified and they want to figure out up their, their nature. And so that's what we are planning to do with the Galileo project um, to figure out the nature of interstellar objects or objects near Earth. And of course, the number that we find will depend on the number per unit volume. This is very different from the Drake equation, which talks about the chance of detecting a radio signal. Here, we are not relying on a radio signal. We are just asking how many objects are there per unit volume. And if we have a survey, then the number we find will depend on that. And um, of course, there are many more small objects than large objects. But the most important factor is what I call the ostrich factor, which is uh, the likelihood of discovery depends also on us, not just on them. Because if we don't search, as was done before the last decade, we will not find anything. So um, I'll just keep a few slides to allow you to ask questions. Um, and I'll focus on um, on the, okay, the most important elements. Uh, so uh, uh, we, if we want to meet the next Tomuamua to date it and get a high resolution image of it, uh, we need a dating app. And that dating app is the Vera Rubin Observatory, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, LSST. It will identify, it has a 3.2 billion pixel camera and will likely identify objects that do not resemble known asteroids or comets that came from outside the solar system. And then we will have to decide which one we want to come close to because the date is very expensive. It costs more than a billion dollars. So most of the time we will swipe to the left, but we might find an object that we want to monitor. And of course the web telescope will be very helpful because it will give us uh, an image uh, of that uh, object from a different direction than earth bound the observatories. Um, and uh, if we have, if we observe a, a given object from two directions, we can get the three-dimensional trajectory using parallax. And um, we could learn much more on whether it has any propulsion in addition to the sun's gravity. Um, and I, I wanted to emphasize the fact that the artificial intelligence astronauts uh, could outlast the sun, and these would be the only worthwhile monuments that are worthwhile uh, in the long term, because any monument that you find on Earth, like uh, the statues or or the paintings that I often find at Harvard Square, uh, you know, will not last beyond uh, the next billion years, be because the sun will burn up the surface of Earth. Earth. And the uh, um, we launched, um, uh, as you know, the New Horizons spacecraft. And one of the embarrassing fact about it is that there was a box attached to that craft that included 30 grams of the ashes of the discoverer of Pluto, Clyde Tambow. And that is embarrassing because if an extraterrestrial finds this box, uh, you know, they would ask, um, who are these humans that they must not be very intelligent because they burned up uh, all the information about an individual that they wanted to commemorate. Because the ashes of Clyde Tamba are no different than the ashes of a cigarette. So my suggestion to NASA was to launch a faster spacecraft that will catch up with New Horizons and uh, go in front of it and apologize for this box. Uh, so the Pentagon uh, has a couple of reports by now, and the Galileo project hopes to identify the nature of those objects. And we have um, seven papers that will be uh, 
posted publicly within a month, a couple of months. And uh, this is a depiction of the various sensors that we have in the first observatory on Harvard University grounds that is already operational. Uh, this is a picture taken after a snowstorm. Uh, we have radio sensors, we have infrared, and we have optical and audio, and they're covering the entire sky. And then we analyze uh, the data with artificial intelligence uh, algorithms. So I will be very brief. Um, you can just look at those images. This is the infrared, uh, um, and this is the optical fish eye camera that is looking at the entire sky. And we also have a camera that will track objects of interest. Uh, we have an acoustic uh, sensor that covers um, frequencies all the way from infrasound to ultrasound, well beyond the capability of the human ear. Um, we also have a passive radar system, and we are measuring any radio transmission from any object in the sky, and measuring the weather. And then we analyze the data uh, using state-of-the-art computer uh, algorithms. Um, um, and uh, we are trying to identify objects of interest. We also use uh, data from satellites that are publicly available. We have a contract with uh, Planet Labs uh, that allow us to uh, look at objects of interest. And we plan to make copies of this first observatory and place them in various locations in the coming year. So altogether, you know, the scientific community is engaged, for example, in the, in the pursuit of the uh, nature of dark matter. Most of the matter in the universe is not known, and there are billions of dollars allocated to that. And uh, scientists often make the statement that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Well, my point is that extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. And uh, the Large Hadron Collider did cost us $10 billion. We were trying to see any evidence for the dark matter produced in it as the lightest supersymmetric particle, and we haven't found it after investing $10 billion. And my point is the Galileo project requires about a percent of that budget, 1%, and then it could address the nature of the objects that the government is speaking about. And that's worthwhile because the public cares a lot about this question. Taxpayers care more about this question than the nature of dark matter. Of course, we can use other methods like looking for industrial pollution or artificial lights on the night side of a planet. Uh, but it's possible that the reason we don't see clear evidence uh, for radio signals is because those civilizations died by now. And if we find objects, they could be either space trash or functional devices like AI astronauts. And um, one uh, important uh, point is we don't have a protocol for how to deal with a visitor to our backyard. But my hope is that um, this would change the future of humanity. Because if you look at human history until now, it was shaped by a group of people trying to feel superior relative to other people. And perhaps if we find a smarter kid on our cosmic block that is far more advanced than all of us, we would start to treat each other as equal members of the human species. And my main message is that if you think about the cosmic play, we are not at the center of the stage. We know that from Copernicus and Galileo. We, the human species also came to exist only in the last few million years. So if you come to a play and you are not at the center of the stage, and also you come late in the play, then the play is not about you. We fail to recognize that. And one way to learn more about the meaning of this cosmic play is to look for other actors who had been around for a while. Maybe they can help us figure out the meaning of this play. 
Thank you. Professor Loeb, thank you very much. A remarkable, a remarkable presentation, um, remarkable set of ideas. And let me right here emphasize, there we go. Your book is a wonderful exposition of all we've had to talk about today. I've, I've enjoyed it very much. Recommend it to everybody. Also recommend to everybody your, um, your opinion essays. And there is a link to the opinion essays uh, in the chat. So with that, we'll open the floor and I'll ask for questions. I don't see your links in the chat. Are you sure you put them there? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I also don't see them. You should put them. Um, no, I hope. Um, right at the top, two books by Avi Loeb, and below <laughs> that, link to Professor Loeb's opinion essays. Is that missing? Yeah, I don't, don't see it. I see it. It's not there. You didn't click on uh, perhaps uh, the return button that will put it for everyone. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, let me let me yeah. let me work on that one. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Questions. Well, I'll ask one. <clears throat> okay. who, who are you? Why don't you say your name? State your name. Oh. Uh, uh, my name is Tim Thompson. I'm a retired uh, JPL wonk. And so I um, just talking about Oumuamua by itself, it had a remarkably red color, which right. looks a lot like a type D asteroid right. <clears throat> or comet. Um, do we know? what the space weathering is like for artificial materials, because that color comes from uh, organics on the surface of an asteroid or something. Uh, and I, I'm, I don't know that artificial material would look that color if it's space weathered. Right. So one thing to recognize is that, the, you know, the solar wind is stopped by the interstellar medium, the interstellar gas, at about 100 times the Earth-Sun separation, 100 AU, okay? Mm -hmm. So most of the Oort cloud, or all of the Oort cloud of, of rocks that were, you know, the building blocks of the planets in the solar system. So any, any comet coming from the outer parts beyond 100 AU is exposed to the same conditions as interstellar objects because nothing is protecting those rocks from interstellar space, okay? So whatever colors you find in the, uh, for comets that come from the Oort cloud or asteroids that may come from there should be shared by interstellar objects because they suffer the same erosion, the same impact. So what, what is shaping their color? Well, it's a bombardment by cosmic rays. You know, that's one thing that, very energetic particles over billions of years will, will cause some roughness to the surface, which presumably is bringing it to this red appearance. Um, also, you know, uh, impacts by micro meteorites if they exist out there or dust particles, impacts by atoms from the interstellar space. So I would imagine, and this is just my guess, that because of the roughness of the surface as a result of all these impacts by dust particles, by cosmic rays, mm -hmm. that you wouldn't see in terms of the color of the surface, if an object has the same age as old cloud objects, you wouldn't see much difference in the colors. What you would see is a difference in composition, but you know, to, to get the composition, we need either the object to evaporate if it comes close enough to the sun, or we need to put our hands on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Anybody, please. Yes, there is one hand up. Go ahead. Kathy? Uh, you're muted, Kathy. You're muted, Kathy. 
Oh, you can't. Can you can you un unmute her? Maybe. Oh, let me unmute her. Um, well, I can only. There ask we go. Now I okay. can. Thank okay. you. Um, so yeah. I'm thinking there's and and I'm I know you know I'm way lower on the level of understanding here, but um, with interstellar objects coming around and into our solar system, is there also the chance that an interstellar object has made it all the way to the Earth? And I might be hiking one day and see something, you know, and, and then could we take it and go, wow, here now we can see what this is made of? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So uh, we did the statistics, okay? And uh, based on the interstellar meteors that are known, two of them, uh, and we um, figured out that one in a thousand uh, objects is from interstellar space. In other words, for every thousand space rocks from the solar system, you find one that came from interstellar space. So if you just find the relic of an object, I mean, there are objects bigger than the size of a person, uh, you know, you end up getting a meteorite, something that remains and lands on the ground. So you, but the problem is, how do you tell that it's interstellar? Okay. And the, the only way I have right now for figuring this out is based on the speed by which the object came. But from the crater of an object, you can't tell its speed because it just reflects the amount of energy the object brought with it. Uh, so, you know, uh, you can't tell uh, if, it's, if it was unbound to the sun or not. And uh, the, the two meteors that I talked about, uh, we catalog as interstellar simply because the U.S. government measured their speed as they, they produced the fireball. So, so, yes, the answer is, there should be objects from interstellar space on Earth. It's just a question of finding them. You know, it's like one in a thousand chance. And many might be under the water. <laughs> right, maybe my, because 71% of the Earth is covered with water. Interesting, yeah. thanks. Another Robert. question, uh, Robert, yes. Robert. Go yeah, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Loeb, thank you so much for this presentation. I'm. Uh, a uh, fisheries biologist retired from NOAA, and I've always been intrigued with the Fermi paradox. And, and um, what I was think, what I wanted to ask you was, what if intelligence is quite different from maybe our perspective of um, possessing technology? And I'm thinking about cetaceans and how uh, we realize that there is some form of intelligence there of self-awareness, but there's a huge spectrum of intelligence that we see on Earth. And if we include the universe, uh, that spectrum might be very wide. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on whether, given a, a particular planet where life evolves, and perhaps maybe even the night sky isn't something that you're that, that's observable. Uh, what if intelligence evolves more towards sort of a, uh, inner being type of thing and not communicative in terms of looking outside the planet and yes. whether that could be part of the Fermi paradox in terms of we're looking for, for species that are like us, but maybe that type of species <laughs> is not only rare, uh, well, is rare in terms of time and space and um, your yeah, thoughts yeah yeah i understand your point and um yes so it's just like dating i i don't know if you remember the days where you were engaged in you know dating uh you know very often you are surprised by the the person you're dating okay because you expect that person to be similar to you but it's different and uh, we don't have a partner and of course, what Fermi was saying, you know, maybe we're single. And if you insist that you're single and you're not checking, you're not going to places where you might find your partner, you will remain sig single. You know, it's a, like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, what you're asking is a, at a deeper level, it's possible that we're not able to find those others because they're not engaged. They're not coming out of where they are. And then... Um, of course, I can imagine one such scenario. Just look at Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook producing the metaverse, the new name of Facebook, you know, this company, where people put goggles on their head 
and live in a virtual reality yes. that is much more flattering to their ego. So all of them, like, you can look through the goggles and you will look like Brad Pitt throughout your life. And you can live near celebrities. You can live in a multi-billion dollar house. You can enjoy what comes out of these goggles. So why would you ever drop those goggles? Now, I'm mentioning that metaphorically because that is equivalent to being high on drugs. You can feel very good, but it's not the reality that we all share. Okay? Also, you know, there are narratives promoted by politicians that do not reflect the reality that we all share. So you can be a believer. You can believe that reality is something else. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is there is this tendency of people to feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. And the metaverse offers the best solution, the metaverse or recreational drugs, whatever you like more. And this way, you will feel good about yourself. Because if you look at the reality that we all share, you know, it has pimples. It doesn't look ideal. You are often disappointed. Like, we are not at the center of the universe. That's disappointing. We are not necessarily the smartest. That's disappointing. So I'm saying you can extend that to your personal life and say, oh, I'm so disappointed with all kinds of things that happened to me that I want to put these goggles and just enjoy myself for the rest of my life, which is a choice that some humans are make, making. You know, some humans are high on drugs. Some of them put these goggles. So you can imagine a civilization that decided to take that approach. And unless you visit their planet and look at them and see these goggles on their head, you will not know that they exist because they are completely you know, out of the reality that we all share, they basically degenerated into Mark Zuckerberg's uh, admirers. <laughs> and um, you know, it's possible, <laughs> that's an answer to Fermi's paradox, that's a possibility. And feel free to quote me if you speak with Mark Zuckerberg, I, I don't care about <laughs> it. I actually met him. <laughs> anyway, that's my answer. Mm. Professor Loeb, if uh, Ken Searcy from San Diego, engineer. Um, it, this is a little interesting philosophizing about the nature of life on other, uh, on, on other planets. Um, we only have one model of life, and it's ours. And we go between being altruistic explorers, as you will, or acting as if we kind of live in a rapacious world like Putin's um, uh, conquest. Uh, model. And that seems to be pretty consistent with our history on, on, on the, in the latter, on the Putin side. And maybe it's because of the competition and survival of the fittest. What would you expect to find in other civilizations? And would they be, and which one of these two models would be the most likely one to send right. exploration devices in our area? Yeah. So that's an excellent question, and um, I would follow Darwin. So Darwin said survival of the fittest, right? That's uh, the thing that you're most likely to find, uh, whoever survived. Um, and in my case, uh, in my book, literally speaking, the, the fittest that survives uh, would be the civilization that uh, maintained longevity or sent copies of itself to interstellar space. Okay, so that's, so survival means that, first of all, you are not narrow-minded like we are, you know, like we put so much attention into what happens on this two-dimensional surface of the rock that we live in. So if you look at the news, the top item is the war in Ukraine. But if you look at the images from the Orion spacecraft that moved around the moon in the past you know, a few months ago, there is no evidence for the border between Ukraine and Russia. From outer space, this is insignificant, yet we focus all of our attention on that. And so 
First thing we need to do if we want to survive longer is instead of fighting each other and killing each other, we should aim higher, okay? Not pay all of our attention to disputes among humans, but think bigger, meaning pay attention to the third dimension rather than the two dimensions on the surface of Earth. There is a third dimension. We just need to look up. And we realize that there is a lot going on out there, okay? So that's the first recipe for survival that you pay attention to the third dimension. You make copies of what we have here on earth and send them to space. And that guarantees that you have a higher chance likelihood of survival because if a catastrophe happens on earth, not everything will be lost. And then the second thing is humans are not the pinnacle of creation. So you might as well decide that artificial intelligence represents our future and that AI astronauts would survive in space if we decide to design them appropriately. And so if I were to imagine what we might find coming in our direction, the most abundant thing would be self-replicating AI systems that are able to multiply just like biological creatures, but are not biology based because biology cannot survive in space. Thank you. Quite remarkable. Mark, Mark, Mark Shedd, you had your hand up a minute ago. Did you, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I was just uh, kind of curious uh, what the perspective we, as a community uh, on Earth are throwing more metal into uh, orbit <clears throat> around the planet, basically uh, causing you know, uh, astronomy, uh, you know, uh, people to, to be concerned about visibility and things like that. Uh, is it also going to start affecting our ability to observe you know, uh, deep space and, and uh, kind of have impact on the plans to discover more about uh, our, our region of the galaxy. Definitely. Uh, so you're referring to the communication satellites that uh, SpaceX, I mean, low, Elon Musk is- low, uh, low Earth mostly, yes. Yeah. And um, um, now we're talking about thousands, but in the future, tens of thousands. And of course, you know, astronomers, always wanted to uh, go to remote sites where there are no city lights. And now we will have city lights in the sky. These communication satellites, which are reflecting sunlight at night and will cause a lot of trouble to the Vera Rubin Observatory, LSST. That's a ma major source of contamination. Uh, and as you say, it will compromise our ability. Now, there are two ways to cope with it. One was suggested by um, SpaceX and for example, to coat those satellites or basically paint them black. Um, they are not doing it. They're still quite metallic and, and bright. And you can see them with your naked eye during daytime uh, if they're situated in the right direction. Um, and the second approach is if they give us the exact trajectory so we can remove those tracks from the images of the skies. But I'm really worried about this. And of course, they have commercial benefits um, out of those. So you have to understand that when you listen to Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos and they talk about space, they talk about it from a commercial perspective. They, they want to make money out of space. And you know, I was with Jeff Bezos uh, at the Washington National Cathedral about a year and a half ago. He was talking about the fact that in the future, he wants to bring a trillion people to space and regard the earth as a national park and all kinds, and that he was inspired by watching Star Trek as a kid. And I didn't like what I heard because it sounds like a commercial enterprise. And and also, frankly, I never enjoyed Star Trek because it violates the laws of physics and I cannot enjoy such a storyline. Uh, I said that to Avery Haynes, the director of national intelligence who was sitting next to me, and she said, we have to work on you, Avi. But the point is, 
when you think about space, I think, you know, the, the way I think is appropriate is not making money out of it, but rather exploring it for no benefit because there is no business plan for leaving the solar system. You can't make money out of that. And that would be the most exciting thing the humanity can do. And I would argue that for the benefit of humanity, we better not focus on making money from space. Um, but scientific exploration is really the motivation that should drive us. So, of course, now they put these communication satellites to make money. And one way to avoid it is to put telescopes in space above them, like putting telescopes on the moon. Uh, but soon enough, the moon will be contaminated with all kinds of uh, space trash around it. Um, so, you know, it's a continuous uh, uh, challenge for, the, for astronomy. But it reflects the fact that most people are not driven by science. They're driven by making money. <clears throat> we, need to do, we need to do something about that. Um, can I ask, people will check the chat and see if the links to uh, Professor Loeb's uh, opinion essays, as well as the uh, references to the books, uh, made it into the chat. Yes, we, it did make it. And in fact, I just checked the chat and I see that one of your participants knows Hebrew. That's nice because there was a message to me, direct message DM in Hebrew. <laughs> Richard, uh, Richard Agler, I'm, I'm not sure if he, yeah, he's, his uh, video is, is off anyway. So, um, Joseph Davidson, you had a comment about the Large Hadron Collider and CERN. Would you like to come in and, uh, and ask that question? Yeah, we have a few minutes, so maybe that would be the last question. That's the last question, yes. Go ahead. Uh, you are muted. Where are you? So we can unmute you. <laughs> What's the name? Joseph Davidson. Okay, let me see if I can find him. You are muted for some reason. Uh, I don't see him in the list. He may not be here anymore. Well, he's still listed. He says he has no microphone. So read his ah, question. Okay, oh. so why, why don't you ask the question and I'll answer it. Go ahead. Well, he says... Um, do you think you could elaborate a bit more on, excuse me, what you said about the Large Hadron Collider and oh, yes. CERN? Yeah. It sounded like you felt it to be somewhat unsuccessful. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the Large Hadron Collider discovered the Higgs particle, which uh, was for, uh, predicted back in the 60s. That was the only accomplishment so far. It basically confirmed old news, uh, which, you know, something very important. It's, it was part of the standard model of particle physics. The Higgs boson gives masses to the elementary particles we know about, but there was nothing new scientifically or intellectually about it. Uh, we were hoping, I mean, the physics community was hoping that the Large Hadron Collider by smashing uh, protons uh, against each other at the highest possible energies, you know, trillions of um, uh, electron volts or, or millions of times the mass of the electron, uh, by, by smashing particles at very high energies will generate new particles that are not known. And in particular, the dark matter or supersymmetric particles. Supersymmetry is a symmetry that since I practiced the uh, physics, you know, I've been at Harvard for 30 years, exactly 30 years. And before that, I practiced um, uh, physics for about 10 years. And um, so altogether, you know, during the last 50 years, that was a very popular idea, supersymmetry, that everyone assumed must be right. And there were a huge number of 
papers written about it, everyone assumed that it must be right. Then the Large Hadron Collider tried to find it in the natural range of parameters and didn't find it. So now we know that supersymmetry doesn't exist in the natural range of parameters. So some, so it's just like, you know, the analogy I make is with um, the Lubavitchers in Brooklyn. I don't know if any of you knows them, but basically they believe this community of Orthodox Jewish people really uh, believe that the, their rabbi is the Messiah. So they actually built a home, a house in Israel that is the replica of the apartment that their rabbi had in Brooklyn. Because the idea of the Messiah is that once he dies, he will come back again and arrive to Israel. Okay? And uh, they wanted him to find the toilets. So they built a replica of his home in Brooklyn, in Israel. They were sure he will be the Messiah. Then he died. And he didn't come back. So the answer is what to do with this information. And what some of them said, okay, we just have to wait. He might come in the future. So what I'm making is an analogy with the way that people that believed in supersymmetry responded to the news from the Large Hadron Collider. What did they say? They said, we just need to wait. We need to build a new accelerator at higher energies. Maybe then it will show up. What I'm trying to say is that human nature and psychology works the same way in religion and in science. If the evidence does not support your notion, you find a reason for that. That's all I wanted to say about the Large Hadron Collider. Well, that's that's an analogy that um, we'll have to probably have to think about for the for a while. We can take home with us. And okay, Avi Loeb, thank you, thank you very much. A, a challenging and and really important discussion. And 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 thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And you are free to post this video anywhere you want. <clears throat> Bye-bye. It, it will be on, uh, on the Palomar Observatory YouTube channel uh, probably sometime later in the week. Thank you. It was a pleasure. The questions were excellent. I really enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you that, very much. Thank you. And with that, let me quickly uh, talk about our next uh, event uh, the Greenway Talks online will continue on Saturday, March 4th. We will be joined by Dr. Casey Law, research scientist with Caltech's Owens Valley Radio Observatory, who is working with a new observing system named RealFast. The system searches data obtained by the very large array in real time for millisecond scale transient radio signals that can be used to detect, localize, and characterize extra galactic fast radio bursts. Dr. Casey will describe the technologies that have been developed and the discoveries that have been made in a presentation titled Fast Radio Bursts nature's newest cosmic mystery. So thank you again, Professor Avi Loeb, and my thanks as well for all of you for attending and supporting the Greenway Talks online. Say goodbye. With that, I'll close the meeting and we'll see you on March 4th. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>